Oh my God, I just finished recording the most powerful, uplifting session that is going to help you in ways you cannot imagine. Wait till you hear the practical tools that my guest Marcy Shymoff is going to share with you, including an exercise to instantly feel better, feel more loving, to raise your happiness set point. That was the goal, but she just exceeded my expectations and ended with some truly stunning stories that will just fill your heart. Stick around for the whole program because this is one show that is packed with not only happiness, but love and goodness. And can't we all use some of that? Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Messages of Hope. I know from the comments that so many of you come to my podcast because you're grieving. Someone you love has crossed the veil, and I know that you find hope here in our programs. Many of us, when we have someone who we love dearly die, think we'll never be happy again. But I have news for you. Happiness is more than possible. My guest today is an expert in happiness. But before I bring her in, I want to tell you one thing I've learned from talking to those across the veil, and it's that they want you to be happy again. And so the depth of your grieving does not in any way show them the depth of your love for them. So keeping that in mind, let me introduce to you my guest, Marcy Shymoff. Before I read her bio, I want to bring her on the camera here. Marcy, welcome to the show. So fabulous to be here with you, Suzanne. I love everything that you do. Oh, well, me too. You, you Year of Miracles program, which we'll talk about, is is truly inspirational. And and your list of accolades, I just don't know any other woman who has those kinds. So let me share them with everybody. I I I normally don't read bios, but yours is so full and so important that I don't want to miss details. So everybody, check this out. Marcy is a number one New York Times bestselling author, a world-renowned transformational teacher, and as I said, an expert on happiness, but also success and unconditional love. How do you become an expert on that? We'll find out. Marcy's books include the runaway bestsellers, Happy for No Reason, here it is, all dog-eared, <laughs> Love for No Reason, and seven titles in the phenomenally successful Chicken Soup for the Women's Soul series. If you're like me, you love those stories. Any of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books just are so uplifting to balance the negative news, right? Marcy is one of the best-selling female nonfiction authors of all time. What an accolade. She's also host of the national PBS television special called Happy For No Reason, like her book title, and is a featured teacher in The Secret and the narrator for the award-winning film, Happy. Marcy currently co-leads a worldwide program, which I mentioned, called Your Year of Miracles, with more than 5,000 participants for, from 87 countries. Talk about spreading ripples around the world, Marcy. And she has inspired millions of people around the world dedicated to helping people live more miraculous, empowered, and joy-filled lives. Wow. I mean, I can't think of a better job. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been very blessed in this life to be able to do this amazing work. I feel like it's just an honor and a privilege. And it's a privilege, especially to get to be with people like you. You know, I've gotten to, I've gotten to interview you and you are just phenomenal. I, I, I really love and I mean it when I say how much I love who you are and well, how you show up. Well, thank you. But, but I want to tell everybody that, you know, I look at you, I read your accolades, people look at me, they think that we've always been these bubbly people. I took the test in your book, the, the questions on uh, happy for no reason. And I am thrilled to say I got 100% without stretching anything. But see, I don't want people to think I was always this way. And I fell for the trap. I thought you were always this way till I read your book. So why don't you start by just talking about your background? And then we'll talk about how it is that anybody can go from a lower score to 100%. Yeah. So, you know, people often ask me, um, you know, they think, oh, Marcy, you were always happy weren't you? And my answer is absolutely not. 
not. I was born depressed. I came out of the womb with existential angst. I had a great family, a great upbringing, but I believe I, I now come to think that I had either ancestral trauma or, you know, some other kind of something that I was carrying with me from a, from a very young age. Yeah, you up in your book when you said that you were the one in the family photos that always looked like you were I, dour. I I had this sour face. Um, and it, you know, it was when I was a little kid. I remember watching Romper Room. I, I ages me <laughs> Romper Room, and I remember <laughs> thinking, how could these people be happy? There's a world that's suffering. You know, I felt like I was carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders as a young kid, and so my solution to my unhappiness and depression as a child was something called sugar. And I was became a sugar addict. And I discovered early on that that really didn't work very well because um, you, you'd get high for a little while and then it would crash. And by the time I was in high school, I was about 35 pounds overweight being addicted to sugar. And so when I was in my 20s, I decided I am going to be happy. I'm going to figure this thing out. And so I did what I think a lot of people do. I set goals for myself and I figured that once I reach those goals, then I'll be happy. And I had five main goals and I'm going to just share them with everybody right now because I think that a lot of people will be able to relate. I wanted to have a successful career helping people. I wanted to have a wonderful husband or life partner, fabulous friends, a comfortable home, and the equivalent of Halle Berry's body. <laughs> <laughs> Now I got four out of the five. I do not have Halle Berry's body, but I have a healthy body for which I am extremely grateful. And I worked really hard to get all my ducks in a row. So I'd have all of that. And you were and reading I, the transformational books along the way, reading your I, book. I was, I was doing all the work. I was reading all the books. I was doing all of that. And I, you know, and I was writing them. I was actually had written. I had a turning point moment in 1998. I had written three of the chicken soup for the soul books at that point. And all three were in the top five on the New York times bestseller list. I had just given a speech to 8,000 people and I had autographed 5,432 books. Somebody was there counting and they had a massage therapist there to massage my hand so I could keep on signing. And I remember ap after autographing that last book on one hand, I felt like an author rock star, but on the other hand, I went up to my hotel room and it was the penthouse suite my client had gotten for me. And I walked over to these huge windows overlooking Lake Michigan. I was in Chicago. I walked over to those windows, took in this view and turned around and collapsed onto the bed and burst into tears. And I burst into tears because I realized I had everything that was on my list that I thought I needed to be happy. And I still felt that emptiness in my heart. And I could no longer continue to fool myself into thinking that just the next thing was going to do it for me because I'd seen, yeah, I'd get happier for a little while and then it didn't work. Yeah, and it was, yeah, it was I break in a second here. Please, please. I, I know that people probably hear you say that and still think, yeah, yeah, but she has all that good stuff. And I just can't emphasize enough that please hear what she's saying. You can strive and get all those things and still feel as empty as a person who has none of those things. That's the point of this program. And there is proof of this everywhere. All you have to do is look at Hollywood. Mm -hmm. If fame and money and looks at all those things were the key to happiness, we'd have a lot more happy people in Hollywood. We have, we see, you know, a lot of depression and suicides and, and so so what I did is I said, I, I know I can't, I, I can't go on this way. I've got to figure something out. And so I dove headfirst into the research on happiness. Mm -hmm. And I started interviewing all of the experts in happiness. And I interviewed a hundred, what I call unconditionally happy people, people who were happy for no reason. I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that. And Suzanne, you would certainly be one of those people I would have interviewed back then at not, not, you know, the, the way you are now, the yeah. way you are now. Exactly. And what I started doing is I started doing what they were doing and it's, it started working. 
And I became happier and happier and happier. And I was so excited about this that I started sharing it with people. I shared it with my mother. I shared it who had always been depressed. I shared it with a number of other people and it started working for them. And that's why I ended up writing the book happy for no reason. And, and, you know, let me just explain that phrase, if I may, happy for no reason. Oh, I love I love the explanation. So please, yeah. Yeah, you know, I do not mean that you walk around 24 seven with a silly grin on your face. I do not mean that you're in some polyamorous state of denial. And I do not mean that everything is working the way you want it to work. What happy for no reason means is that you have an inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on your circumstances. So yes, hard things happen in life. People die and you are going to feel grief. That is absolutely natural. And along with that, you can also have that inner state of peace and well-being that allows you to be more resilient and bounce back. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about not burying our heads in the sand. We're talking about having this inner state that you carry with you wherever you go. So you're not looking for life to give you happiness. Yeah, you, you put it so in your book, you had this little spectrum and you said there's happy for good reason, like that's you right. won the lottery. And then that's there's right. happy for bad reason, like you ate a lot of sugar, right? That's right. <laughs> And then now what you're talking about is happy for no reason. That's that's that state that we call joy with a capital J. Yeah, that, that's yes. not dependent on external things. And, you know, that's the only place where our freedom lies. Hmm. That is the only kind of, of happiness that, that people really, ultimately, we all care about because it's lasting. It's not, you don't have to make life bend to look a particular way to be happy. Well, freedom. Now, let me just tell you one little piece of research that I think everybody should know, because to me, it, it explained everything to me. And that is that we all have something called a happiness set point. And the set point is like a thermostat setting. And whatever happens to us, whether it's good or bad, we will return to our thermostat setting unless we do something consciously to change it. I just discovered this six months ago. And it was a, just a light bulb went off because obviously I hadn't read your book yet. I wish I had. It wouldn't take it so long. Well, you know, it's to me, it's just like this is this is where I think everybody in the world should know this yeah. because here we have. I think crack, ha, science has cracked the happiness code because we know what it takes for people to be happier. We actually know what it takes for people to raise their happiness set point. So that's the key. You know, if you win the lottery, and we just talked about that, if you win the lottery, you would be happier for a few months. Within a year, you will return to your original happiness set point. And the same is true of tragedies. Yeah. You will definitely go through periods of, of grief, but you will return to your original happiness set point. So the key here is the set point. What we want to do is we all want to raise the set point. Well, how is our set point raised? This is the coolest part. They figured out how the set point is determined. Hmm. Your set point is 50% genetic. It's your DNA. Okay, I was not born with those good genes. But we're going to come back to that. It's um, 10%. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's 10% your circumstances. And that is such a tiny little piece of the pie, yet that's what everybody is running around trying to fix to make their lives better. Such a tiny piece of it. The other 40% is your habits of thoughts and behavior. And that's what you can really shift to shift your happiness set point. That's where we have the most control. But I'll take it a step further and go back to that 50% that was genetic. Yeah. So there are scientists in the field of epigenetics, which is the study of our genes. And they have found that when you change your habits of thoughts and behavior, that will also influence or change your DNA. And what that means is that 90% of our happiness set point is can be influenced by our habits. Like that to me is just great news. All we need to do is learn the specific habits of happiness, pr start practicing those, and it, it can permanently change your happiness set point. I think this should be taught in all the schools. You know, the earlier we learn this, the better. Yeah, yeah. The more happy we are on a normal basis, the less we're going to lash out at others, right? 
Wow. So yeah. let me just ask you the point this brings up to me is what about people who are taking antidepressants for chemical imbalances? That would be, is that part of the 50% genetic or is the chemical imbalance caused by the thoughts? You, we can't really know. You know, I definitely had, uh, you know, my mother had low grade depression and I definitely had low grade depression for many, many years. And what I will say is I am not a doctor and no one should go off of their medication. Right. Uh, no one should do anything with, uh, no one should go off their medication without consulting with their doctor. Right. And what I have seen is that when people have done some of the things that we talk about, when they've changed some of their habits, they have been able to go off medications. Um, they've also, sometimes people have used some more herbal kinds of, of solutions. Like if you have low serotonin, for example, there are some natural things that can help the body chemistry. So, and I'm happy to talk about what some of those things are that can help as well. Um, so we can maybe circle back to that at some point. Okay. That's a good goal. <laughs> okay. Good, good. So when I, when I was when I learned about the set point six months ago and dived in, I learned that there were two things to naturally raise it, meditation and service to others. But you've broken your book down into seven areas, which I find very intriguing. Yeah, I, I what I did is in interviewing all those people and all the researchers, I gathered all of what are the habits that people have. The only difference between happy people and everybody else is that they have different habits. Huh. And um and so I found that there were 21 main happiness habits and they fall into seven main categories. And it's hard for people to remember seven of anything. So I created a metaphor. Uh, I call it building your inner home for happiness so you can remember this better. And what I wanna do is I wanna go through these seven areas and I'd like everyone to be thinking about where am I the weakest? Nice. Because wherever you're the weakest, that's your Achilles heel and that's where you wanna start and Suzanne, at the end of this, I'm going to ask you what you're, where you're the weakest, if that's okay. Can I oh, put you on the spot? Okay, but I'm just so excited because yeah, this is supposed to be just a regular old podcast and you all are getting a workshop with a New York Times bestseller and expert on happiness. How cool is this? <laughs> well, thank you for letting me share all this. It's, it was, it's what lights me up. Um, so these seven areas, as they relate to your inner home for happiness, there are seven areas of a home. There's a foundation there's four corner pillars, there's a roof, and there's a garden. Here's how that relates to the main areas of happiness. The foundation is taking responsibility for your life and your happiness. And what that means is not showing up in life as a victim. Mm -hmm. And you know you're a victim when you're blaming, shaming, or complaining. Blaming other people for why you can't be happy. Shaming, which is blaming yourself for why you can't be happy or complaining about why everything in life is wrong and you can't be happy. So if you find yourself putting your unhappiness on anything outside of yourself or on blaming yourself, you what the very first step is to create a stronger foundation of taking responsibility for your happiness. Let me just clarify here. When we're looking for the weak point, or is it one of 21 or, or the foundation? One of seven, one of these seven areas. Okay. okay. So that area is, is taking responsibility for your life, showing up as a victor in life or as a co-creator in life. I know this is a lot about what you speak about as well. And rather than showing up as a, as a victim. Then there are these four corner pillars of our home. And there's the pillar of the mind, the pillar of the heart, the pillar of the body and the pillar of the soul. So the pillar of the mind is our thoughts. Do your thoughts rob you of happiness? You know, do you have those negative spinning thoughts? Then there's the pillar of the heart. I have never met a happy person who had a closed heart, <laughs> ever. Happy people are open-hearted. They're, they're loving, they're generous, they're kind, they're forgiving. So if you have a bit of a closed heart, then that may be where you want to start. You know, the one comment I get from so many people about our Awaken Way community is, your community, they're so nice. 
So this is not going to be a weak point of most of the people paying attention here. So it's going to be interesting. How can we be so kind and loving yet feel empty, feel not be happy? So this is. Ah, I, I'm so glad you said that because that loving piece needs to also be loving towards yourself and generous towards yourself and forgiving towards yourself. So if you find that you can be loving and giving towards everybody else, but not towards yourself, then that's something to work on. That is still the, the pillar of the heart. Um, then there is the pillar of the body and that's your biochemistry. Do you have the chemicals for happiness? Do you have enough serotonin and oxytocin and dopamine and, and you know, all the good guys? Um, and, and by the way, that was my weakest. That's where I was weak. And that's where I needed to start was on the level of the neurochemistry. Huh. Uh, Interesting. So I, I started learning about that when we got puppies and I learned that just holding the puppy gets oxytocin flowing. Unfortunately, so it's shopping for a woman. <laughs> so again, so unfortunately, I learned that shopping also gets oxytocin oh, yes. for women. Yes, so. that's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think a puppy is, I, I, I'm about to get a puppy. So I'm, I'm going for that oxytocin rush. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then there is the pillar of the soul. Certainly what you speak about, and that is being connected to the greater energy of life, you know, and I don't care what you call it, whether you call it God, the divine nature, creative intelligence doesn't matter, but it has to do with feeling that we, that you are part of this bigger energy of the universe. And that energy of the universe is all in support and love of you. So then there is the roof to our home for happiness. And that is our purpose or passion in life. Are you living an inspired life? Did we get all four pillars? We got, we got, yes, we got the foundation, which is taking responsibility for your life. The four pillars are the mind, the heart, the body, and the soul. And the soul. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now we're on the roof, which is our purpose in life. And that, that are you doing what you're here on the planet to do? I believe that e every one of us is here for a purpose. It's not an accident that we're alive and we're here to fulfill a certain, and it changes throughout our lives, but are you, are you doing what it is you feel you are called here to do? And then finally, there is the garden and the garden is who you surround yourself with. Are you surrounded by roses and gardenias? You know, the people that inspire and uplift you. Or are you surrounded by the weeds, the people that drag you down, that you feel, oh, this is, this is hard. And so those are your seven areas. I'll just review them. And I want everyone to acknowledge for themselves and maybe share with others, where are you the weakest? the pillar of the foundation, taking responsibility, the pillar of the mind, the pillar of the heart, the pillar of the body, the pillar of the soul, the roof or the garden relationships. Purpose is the roof or the garden relationships. So which one would you say? I'm, I'm very happy that they're almost all, I'm very happy with all of them, but probably taking responsibility. I, I, I find it so curious when, you know, when we lose our keys, even it's like, where'd you put them, honey? <laughs> you know, immediately. <laughs> else, you know, happy. It's little minor things like that. I hope, because uh, I I have worked really hard on all of these without knowing I was doing it. But that's probably the one. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because for me, it was the body, and that's where I had to start. And whenever I start to uh, go a little bit down, that's where I have to go back to right away. I have to look at, okay, what am I doing with my body that can help me feel better? So usually what your Achilles heel is, is the one that you're going to um, go back to when you find yourself a little bit uh, sliding perhaps. So, so should we give some, some specific things to do for some oh, of the most common ones? Definitely. Because that's what I love about your book. It is just jam packed with practical steps. So yeah, please. Well, well, you tell me where we you'd like to start and I'll start wherever you'd like. I mean, I can tell you the one where that most people have. Sure, that's that's perfect. Okay. The thoughts. Mm. That's the one where most people get tripped up. We have, you know, we just tend to be really kind of having a lot of negative spiraling thinking. 
And here's the thing about our thoughts. The average person has 60,000 thoughts a day. And for the average person, 80% of those are negative. Huh. So if you find yourself in that state, the first thing not to do is don't beat yourself up for it. It's natural. And I'll tell you why. We inherited this. It's called the um, negativity bias. It's the bias to remember the negative. We inherited it from our cavemen ancestors who needed it in order to survive. We no longer need that, but we haven't adapted well enough yet to go, okay, I don't need to hold on to the negatives. You know, we, my friend, Rick Hansen is a, is a um, neuroscientist, neuropsychologist, and he wrote a book called Hardwiring Happiness. And he says that our minds are like Velcro for the negative. The negative just sticks to our minds and they're like Teflon for the positive. The positive just slide off. Happy people have reversed that tendency and they have, they, their minds are more like Velcro for the positive and Teflon for the negative. I'll give you an example, simple example. If you get 10 compliments in a day and one criticism, what are you going to remember at the end of the day? Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Most people remember the criticism. Yeah. Happy people, uh-uh, they're not going to go there. They're not going to feed that. And what we need to do is we need to create new uh, neural pathways in the brain for the positive. That's I actually- love that. That, that. that is so hopeful that everybody can change that if you're willing to. It really is. And what's even more hopeful is that it's not as hard as it sounds. Hmm. I'm going to give you right now three simple steps that are scientifically proven to create new neural pathways in the brain. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, here we go. Step number one, be on the lookout for the good. There's so much, we get 11 billion bits of information that comes our way every second. We only pay attention to a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, and we pay attention to what our our neural pathways are used to. So we have to recreate, we, we have to build new neural pathways into the brain to be on the alert for the positive. So we do that by consciously being on the lookout for the good. Uh, one of the women I interviewed for Happy for No Reason pretends that she is the Academy Awards Committee. And her job every day is to give out five Academy Awards. Oh. And so she will just be scanning throughout her day for who, what gets an Academy Award. So she'll see somebody doing a really kind act and she'll go, oh, that gets the kindest act of the day award. Or she'll see a cute little fluffy white dog and she'll go oh that gets the cutest dog of the day award so that's step number one I you have five academy awards yeah can I interrupt a second i know you won't forget your steps <laughs> oh no i won't the media wants us to see the negative and that's something we have to be aware of my husband got an email this morning i just glanced down on his phone and i saw it and i just thought this is what keeps us trapped the subject line of the email was want to feel your blood boil watch this. Yeah. Like, and I looked at that and I said, no, that's a choice. Right. So this is what you're saying. Well, yeah. And actually, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because we get addicted to the negative. Yes, ma'am. That's why the media feeds us all this stuff. It's like, you go, Oh God, I want to read that. Yes. What will make my blood boil because it gives us this rush of adrenaline yeah. and we get addicted to that adrenaline. So we actually need to retrain our systems. It's a perfect example that you brought up. And so we just need to, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Set up. Yeah. Um, so, so be on the lookout for the good. Give out five Academy Awards a day. If you've got children or grandchildren, play this game with them. Mm -hmm. Start training early, you know? Let's do the Academy Awards game. So that's the first step. The second step is to savor the good for at least 20 seconds. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, the research shows, scientific research shows that it takes 20 seconds for the good to settle enough to actually create new neural pathways. It doesn't take as long for the negative to reinforce itself because we're so used to it. May I add a little statistic that really impressed me? It takes the body 90 seconds to metabolize anger, meaning to get rid of it. So when I 
if somebody around me is angry and I go like this, if I feed it, it'll stay. But if I time a minute and a half, if I don't give in in a minute and a half, it'll be completely gone. So that is, I did not know that. But actually, in a little bit, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to walk us through a little exercise that's 90 seconds that is specifically to reset the heart rhythms. Nice. Okay. Okay. All right. So the second step then is to savor the good for at least 20 seconds. And that means when you see a beautiful sunset, rather than going, oh, there's a beautiful sunset, you stand there and you let it in for at least 20 seconds. If you see a cute dog, you don't go, oh, there's a cute dog. You walk over to the owner and you go, you know what? Your dog just got my cutest dog of the day award. And what that does is it also helps make that person's day, but it creates a conversation that you're in that that lets this experience last for at least 20 seconds. And if you can't- Tell us again over, why, why the 20 seconds? 20 seconds is how long it takes for something positive to register deeply enough to start creating the new neural pathway in the brain. Okay. For wow. Otherwise you just notice it and it goes away. It doesn't, it doesn't stick enough. It doesn't become Velcro. That 20 seconds allows it to become more Velcro. Sticky. Huh. Okay. And then the third thing is to go for a three to one ratio, which means three positives for every one negative. So now you're going to have naturally the negatives are going to show up. You do not want to get upset at yourself for that. You know, oh, there's a negative thought instead of beating yourself up for it. No, it's natural. That's just the habit. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for three things to replace that instead. Now, obviously, if it's something that needs your attention, you give it your attention. You know, it, and I know that there are a number of people here who have been in the process, who have been in grief. You don't bury the grief. You allow it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. And the more you actually allow it, the more it is able to heal on its own. So I definitely don't want to give the impression that this is just let's push that out because that's not the case. I'm talking about just these automatic kind of negative things that just aren't feeding anything. That's what you want to replace. Now, are you speaking just of gratitude for these things? Because I know how powerful that is. Or when you're looking for three positive things, would how does gratitude get yeah. in there? Yeah, it could be anything. It could be, you know, I am so grateful right now that I'm sitting here with you. I am so grateful right now that I have a connection to another energy that's that's helping with with allowing this information to come through i'm happy right now that there are beautiful trees outside my window okay that shifted me yeah yeah beautiful yeah, yeah. And, it's, and scientifically proven to raise your happiness set point that's the coolest thing it is it is scientifically proven and it thrills me that they are things that are that simple simple and the yeah. neat thing is you can take the test in your book when you start this process and then take it over time and notice your score coming up absolutely besides just noticing hey i'm happier in general i don't feel so empty anymore yeah that what you're talking about is the self-assessment to see where you are on this happiness scale where you're on the happiness continuum um well is this a good time to do that exercise because i don't want to forget it Sure, we can totally do that exercise. To this is your heart rhythms. That's right. I want to do this. <laughs> so here's the thing. I learned this from a, a group called the Institute of Heart Math. I knew it. <laughs> okay, they're, good. They're the world's leading researchers on the heart and happiness. And what they found is, I think it's similar to what you just said. They found that five minutes of anger can suppress the immune system for up to six hours. Whoa. Five minutes of love and appreciation can strengthen the immune system for up to six hours. So what we're feeling now can have a long-term impact on us. You go through your whole day angry, you're going to have a nervous system and a, and a whole biochemistry that's going to reflect that. And become ill more easily. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what they found is that when you're in anger or upset or frustration, you go into what's called heart rhythm incoherence, where your heart rhythms get very erratic. 
when you're in love and appreciation, you go into heart rhythm coherence where your heart rhythms become very, uh, very smooth and aligned. And we're not going to do five minutes of it. We're going to do about a minute and a half. And uh, this is the process they teach called the inner ease technique. It's one of their many processes and I, I love using it. Um, so we're all going to do it together. Please, if you're listening to this, as long as you're not driving, please do this because just listening to us do it will not do anything for you. So we're going to do it together right now. All right. And Suzanne, you're going to be my guinea pig. I'm going to ask you to tell me how you feel at the end of this. Okay. Check how you feel at the beginning, right? Check how you feel at the beginning and check how you feel at the end. Okay. So if you close your eyes now, you can do this with your eyes open, but I think it goes a little deeper with eyes closed. And the first step is to simply place the palm of your hand on your heart. And the act of putting your hand on your heart starts the flow of the chemical called oxytocin, which we spoke about a little bit earlier. Oxytocin is known as the love hormone. It's what we have more of when we feel bonded and connected with each other or when you're holding that little puppy. But just putting your own hand on your heart like this is starting the flow of oxytocin, is boosting the flow of oxytocin in your system. Now, the second step is to imagine that you are breathing in through the center of your heart. So you can feel or picture that your breath is coming in through your heart. It can go all the way down to your belly, but it's coming in through your heart. And then it's going back out through your heart. This is called heart-focused breathing. And you may already notice that you're starting to feel a little different. Then the third step. Third step is on every in-breath, imagine that you're breathing in love, ease, and compassion into your heart. So just every inhale, breathe into your heart, love, ease, and compassion. And just exhale out of your heart as we did before. And you're going to do this at your own pace. And when you inhale love, ease, and compassion, you can think about someone that helps you feel that way or a beloved four-legged. You can remember a time when you last felt that way. Or you could just say the words internally to yourself and that will also work. Breathing into your heart, love, ease, and compassion. And breathing out of your heart. And one more time, taking a deep breath in through the heart. Breathing in love, ease, and compassion. And exhaling out of your heart. And you can slowly take your hand away. And when you feel ready, you can slowly open your eyes. And that was probably less than a minute and a half. Yeah, I was checking my clock over here, just coming up on a minute and a half now. Yeah. So just notice, I want everyone to notice, how do you feel different either physically or emotionally or both? And so Suzanne, your answer. Well, I was already feeling bubbly and happy just being in your presence and sharing with the community here. However, what I experienced during that and now is uh, part of my language, but I just want to spew love all over everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. This, this, like I say, that this work takes you from an emptiness that can't be filled to a fullness that cannot be contained. And mm. that hand on the heart, that did it for me right from the start. Yeah, mm, that's beautiful. And and that is certainly one of the experiences of what's called the love response. There's a scientific. Um, so we've all heard of the stress response. You know, when we're stressed out, there is a whole host of things that happen to us. We have different brain activity. We have different heart rhythms. We have different biochemistry when we're in the stress response. Well, researchers have also found that we can go into the love response huh. and the love response has its own signature brain activity, heart rhythms, and biochemistry. And so what you were describing there was the love response. And what other people may have felt during this was, oh, I just felt more grounded or more calm or more peaceful. Some people felt maybe tingling in their hands and feet or a warmth in their heart, or even some people feel almost like a cool liquid through their heart. All of these are signs of moving into the love response. 
And now here's the thing. Doing this once like this is just a nice experience. It will not change your life. What will change your life? If you were to do this a couple of times a day for the next few weeks, you would start to habituate the love response and it would become more and more your default state. So I've done this thousands and thousands of times. And now all I have to do when I start to feel a little agitated is go like this and start to breathe in and out of my heart. And immediately my body knows that and I move into the love response. That's what can help change our happiness set point. You know, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to to help you bring this to more people. This is what our world needs. That the, my guides say all the time, every one of us changes our world one person at a time. And we can't do that when we're in a, a less than happy state, right? We can't. And, and our happiness affects the people all around us. I say to people, if you want to do something for your children or your family, raise your own happiness set point because it will impact them. They, the research now shows that we impact five people out at least. And that means that your happiness level affects your neighbors, cousins, sons, school teacher, yeah. you know, I mean, just all over. So really, really, it matters. It matters. Wow. Can, can I give one? I feel inspired to give one around for people who, like me, have uh, had the body, the biochemistry. Oh, good, please. You mean some, like another to... exercise or, or practice or what? It's a practice. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's a simple, simple practice. See, earlier I said, the thing about this is that it's not hard. There are things that we can do. And, and when we take baby steps, that's what makes the difference for us. And I'm going to ask people at the end to pick one thing that we've talked about that you will commit to doing for a week to see if it makes a difference because don't take my word for it. You know, we want you to use your own life as an experiment. So this exercise I'm going to give you right now is to raise the serotonin in your body. And I had low serotonin Wow. And um, I, and serotonin is probably the, the main, one of the main happiness chemicals. And I learned this from a man named Gilles Marin. He is a Qigong master, a Qinitsong master. And, and he said that all you have to do is go stand in the sun. And I'll tell you, if you are not somewhere where there's sun, what you can do instead. But all you do is you go stand in the sun for about two minutes and you close your eyes, super important, this part of the instruction, close your eyes, face your head towards the sun with your eyes closed and allow the, the beams from the sun to come in through your closed eyelids and hit, imagine it going into the middle of your head, the pineal gland, and it stimulates the pineal gland. Imagine the rays of the sun warming up the pineal gland. And then if you want, you can imagine it kind of flowing down through your whole body Doing that two minutes a day, twice a day for a week will reset your serotonin. And your serotonin is related also to your melatonin, which helps you sleep. So awesome. the more serotonin you have, the more melatonin you'll have and you'll sleep better. And the better you sleep, the happier you are. The research shows that the better you sleep, the, the, your happiness today is more dependent on the quality of your sleep last night than it is on your income level or your marital status. Wow. So the better you sleep, the happier you'll be. So you'll have more serotonin, more serotonin you'll have, you'll have more melatonin. So it's a cycle of serotonin and melatonin that can really help boost your happiness biochemicals. And, uh, and, and another little tip is uh, going to bed by 10, three nights in a row will also help reset the melatonin, which will help reset the serotonin. So those are just for people who have the lower body stuff. Okay. And those people who live in cloudy areas. Oh, good. Thank you for reminding me. If you are, if, if there's clouds, but there's still a little sun beaming through, you can just use those beams too. But if it's raining or, you know, you're not able to see the sun, um, nature, just stare at some nature for two minutes, Ooh. a tree, some huh. flowers, just looking at beauty in nature will also help build the serotonin and imagine the beauty. In that case, you do it with eyes opened, 
Um, and you imagine the beauty coming in and hitting the pineal gland. What about these lights? I know that uh, uh, my, our executive producer for the show, Lynette Seth Scorn, has this light, you know, a special seasonal affective disorder light. And I've heard about them. Are they as effective? I think they're great. I, I definitely think they're great, especially if you live in an area that has, um, you know, long, long winters and all of that, where there's uh, maybe a lot of cloudiness. I love those lights. This is funny because this is we're talking about Lynette, my guide, who was her her soul sister across the veil, just gave me this tickle in my hair that she does because she's here. And she's like, yeah, yeah, the light is good. The light is good. Oh, that is so great. Oh, my goodness. So many powerful, helpful tools. I have this feeling that we could sit with you for hours and be overwhelmed with tools. Yeah. Well, I think I think that. um I think the biggest thing I want people to have is hope, hope, because I know, especially during these times, we're in challenging times, no doubt. And I know that a lot of people who are listening also are in, in challenging times in their own life. You know, you've said to me that, that many people are, are experiencing grief uh, of a lost one, lost loved one. And I think that it's important to recognize that even when we are in grief, it is okay to be happy. It, it, it doesn't do a disservice. It's not dishonoring to the loved one if we become happier. It's not saying that we're not missing them. They would want us to be happier. It actually is a beautiful thing. I May I tell a quick story? Well, I was going to say, you know, the woman who has seven chicken soup for the woman's soul books had better tell us a story. <laughs> Well, um, oh gosh, may I tell you, I'll tell you a personal story and then I'll tell you one from the chicken soup. Oh, outstanding. Yeah. So when I loved my father, had a beautiful relationship with my father and with my mother, who, by the way, um, is never too old to become happy. My mother was in her eighties, mm -hmm. early eighties when I wrote chicken soup for the, uh, when I wrote, um, when I started doing the research for happy for no reason. And she became my first guinea pig. And she was just always, she was a lovely woman, but all was always depressed. And, um, and I started telling her some of these things to do and she started doing them. And my mother in her eighties became the happiest person. It was amazing. She was 87 and she was in the middle of a surgery and I, she just finished an emergency surgery and she came out and she had tubes all over her tubes out of her mouth and tubes out of her nose. And I, I'm bending over to her and said, I said, mom, how are you? She looked up at me and she said, honey, I'm happy for no reason. I thought, oh yeah, mom, you got it. Anyway, that was not the story I was going to tell you. It's all right. It works. But I, what I want you to know is it doesn't matter what age you are when you start with this. Very um, <laughs> My father was just my dear, dear person, dearest person. And he passed away at age 91. And I'd always worried, you know, how am I going to be when he leaves? And so I had asked him before he left to give me a sign that everything was okay. And I will tell you, when he left, I felt his presence everywhere. I mean, it was, it was, I didn't, I just felt him with me. And, um, and a week after he died, I was going to sleep. And I said to my husband, dad hasn't given me a sign yet. And my husband said, Marcy, you're a little impatient. It's only been a week. <laughs> well, we went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, the alarm goes off in the house. Huh. And, and the, the, um, I look at the clock and it says 333. And the special number that my husband and I have between us is 333. Cosmic things always happen at 333. So I went, oh my God, that's interesting. Yeah. And we went through every room in the house to see where the alarm was. Was this alarm clock? What was going on? Where's the alarm? We couldn't find it. And finally, we made it to the area near the front door. And we'd had a little altar, a little table set up with my dad's picture on it and some flowers. Yeah. And I walked over to that table and I said, dad, is that you? And immediately the alarm stopped. Oh, I love it. And, and there's more. We go back to sleep and I say to my husband, God, that was amazing. But I'd love it if he sent another sign. And my husband said, come on, is that not enough? Well, we go to sleep and a half an hour later, the alarm goes off again. This time we get up and we go straight down 
to the table and said, okay, dad, is that you? And immediately the alarm went off. The next morning, we have a contractor coming to the house to work on something completely different. We explain, we said, would you look and see where there's a short circuit in our alarm system? And he looked through the whole alarm system and he said, it's not hooked up. It's at, there's no electricity coming to your alarm system. It is absolutely impossible that your alarm would have gone off. Uh, there was a special power, a special force powering that alarm. That is awesome. You can't. I, I, I knew you'd appreciate that. Nation stories, right? The NOE. Yeah. Just that. amazing. Yeah. But I, I, I think I want to, if I may, just share one last story about, um, you know, I now teach about living in the miracle zone. And I call that the place where you're in flow where life is just kind of working, where the phone call that you need comes when you need it. You know, you need an extra thousand dollars and a check comes in the mail out of nowhere for a thousand dollars. There's just this feeling like life is with you. That's the universe that's, saying you are aligned, right? Aligned. That's it. That's the word. You are aligned. And and so I have so many examples. And I think where I got the ideas, the, the initial idea that, that we live in this miraculous world and we can live in this miracle zone that I, I call it, is when I was reading the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, what, writing the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, because I read about 20,000 stories that were submitted to us. And I would say at least a quarter of them were miracle stories. And I know that miracles, big and small, can happen in all of our lives. And I'll just share with you one of the kind of big miracle stories that happened. Um, it's a story called, and it's in a chicken soup for the soul book. It's called, It Happened on a Brooklyn Subway. It was in 1948. And there was a man named um, Marcel Sternberger. And he was, he lived in New York and he every morning would take the, the subway into his uh, into his job. He would take the 909 subway like clockwork. But this one particular morning, he stopped to see a friend who was sick and he took a later subway. And when we got on that later subway, there was only one seat that was open and he went over and he sat down in that one seat. And he noticed that the man sitting next to him was reading a Hungarian newspaper. And Marcel was originally from Hungary and he turned to him and he said, you know, are you from Hungary? And they, they started talking and he found out that this man's name was Bella Paskin. And he found out that, um, that Bella had just arrived in America, in New York, a few months earlier after, after having gone through all kinds of atrocities during the war. And Bella told him the story about how he lived in this village in Hungary and he had gone off, he had been uh, taken captive during the war. And, and, and when he came back to his hometown, his entire family had been killed, including his beloved wife, Maria. And he had just come to America to start a new life. Marcel said, this is the weirdest thing. What is your wife's name? And, and um, Bella said, well, my wife, she's been dead. For, ten, for, for a few years now, but her name was Maria. Now, Marcel had been at a, at a party the week before and had heard the story, a similar story from someone, a woman, and he'd written down her name and her phone number on a piece of paper that was in his pocket. He grabbed Bella. He said, he didn't say anything. He just grabbed him. He said, come with me. We're getting off at the next stop. They got off at the next stop. They went to a pay phone. They called up the number on his piece of paper. And they said, and, and she said, he said to the woman on the phone, what was your husband's name? And she said, my husband, he's been dead for years, but his name was Bella Paskin. Marcel turned to Bella, handed him the phone and said, this is your wife. Say hello. I mean, it happened on a Brooklyn subway. Yep. Yep. That, my definition of a miracle is when the veil parts enough that we see we are part of a web that is so much bigger than this physical world. There are absolutely universal forces bringing us together like that. Wow. Isn't that awesome? And I, this is why I so love what you do. You, I, you, you live this, you see this and you know this and you share about it with people in a way that's so understandable. Yeah. Well, this is what you do. And helping millions. What a, what a gift. 
I, I, I'd like to stay on this high note and we'll bring it back to a high note, but I do remember trying to help a woman who was so, so stuck in her victimhood. Mm -hmm. she could not get out of it. I tried, I sent her to somebody to try to help, but she, it was all, I was, you know, I, you know, it's everybody else has done these things to me. I'm, there's no changing. Surely there, the reason I'm bringing this up, there must be somebody listening right now who feels that so many things have happened and, and is a victim. What, how, what do you say to them? I can only say this. I can only say what I've noticed from all the people that I have interviewed. And I have interviewed people who've been through atrocities and who are deeply happy. That they all have one common belief. And that common belief is that we live in a friendly universe, a benevolent universe. Einstein said, the most important question we can ask ourselves is, is this a friendly universe? Is this a benevolent universe? And if you answer that yes, then instead of feeling like life is happening to you and all these things are happening to you, that you believe that life is happening for you. The universe is always trying to support us, even though it may not look that way on the surface. So I, I found a question that you can ask yourself is if you feel like you are like, everything's awful and why did this happen to me and I'm a victim? Ask yourself the question, if this is a loving universe, and if this is happening for a higher purpose for me, what might that be? And just try that on. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to totally buy it. Just try it. Just, you know, if that happened for me, if that bad thing that happened actually happened for me, what might that be for? And I can see, though, how people who are stuck would still not be able to see it. And because negative bias we talked about so what you're showing me marcy is how synergetic your system is these seven pillars they all work together don't they they really do and you know if you find yourself by the way in a victim mode like you tend to always go into victim mode there's a fun little game i like games that you can play it's called the blame shame and complain game mm. and you get uh, some $1 bills or some quarters, doesn't matter, or whatever currency you have. And every time you notice yourself or you play this game with your family or with coworkers, every time you find yourself blaming, shaming, blaming yourself or complaining, you put a dollar in the bowl, in a bowl. And I, the first time I played this, I was at a workshop and I thought, I've got this down. You know, I, I teach this stuff. And the first day I had to give like $14 into the bowl <laughs> and it, you, you, we're just not aware of it. And then the second day was maybe like seven. I had to go back and get more $1 bills at the front desk of the hotel. And in the, by the third day it was down to three. It's an awareness thing. We, it's just about becoming aware of how often we are doing the things we're doing. That is the first step to any change. I, I don't like to do most of the talking and I, and I love your stories, but I have to share one that you just, oh, please, my mind it, that I found and shared on this Alaska cruise that I led this year earlier, the a perfect definition for complaining, which is objecting to reality in a way that isn't helpful. And is this it, right? That is it. And so I tasked everybody in the workshop on, on the cruise ship to to notice, just like you said, to be aware when you're complaining. Well, the lesson on complaining took place when the ship was rocking and rolling. I was literally dancing around the stage just to stay upright and people were not feeling really well. And I went through the dining room that evening and there was a woman who was good enough to, oh, it was the next day, it was the next day. She was at the table and she said, I have to tell you, I was so impressed with how you were staying upright on the stage. She said, I went back to my room and I threw up, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, well, you know, it's all in how we come to life. It's what are we bringing to life? Not what is life bringing to us? Yeah. I think, I, you know, I think probably like you, I believe that life is a school. We're here on this, in this school and we each have our own individual curriculum and something happens for me, because it's for my curriculum to learn. And I better not compare myself to what's happening to other people 
because they have their own individual curriculum. Isn't that a beautiful way to look at it? Yeah. Oh, wow. This hour went so fast. I could just talk to you for hours. Maybe you'll come back again and share some more tips. I would love to. Any opportunity to get to be with you. And, and <laughs> I, I really, you know, I have a passion for this. And I, I'd love to end on one idea, if I may. Great, great. People say, people ask me if it's selfish to want to be happier. You know, all we've done is really talked about ourselves. Well, I'm going to be happier, but what about the world? And my answer is, it's the least selfish thing that you can do because when you're happier, you are doing the most that you can do for the world. And there's a beautiful Chinese proverb that sums this up that I like, love to share. It goes, when there's light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. When there is beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. When there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. And when there is order in the nation, there will be peace in this world. Man. And my prayer and my wish for every single one of us is that we know that light in our own souls, that happiness in our own hearts. And through that, we help create peace on this planet of ours. Wow. Well, you're sure doing your part and then some, Marcy. How do people learn more about you and what do you have coming up where people can actually participate with you? Well, we you can learn more about me at youryearofmiracles.com, youryearofmiracles.com or happyfornoreason.com. And we have what's coming up for me is two things. I'm certifying people to become happiness trainers. Oh, that's great. And I also am, am uh, we have our year of miracles program uh, happening. So, and, and we all know that by teaching you, I mean, you become what you're teaching and then some, right? So there's a motivation. Wow. That's right. Well, thank you so much. I, I know I speak for everybody who's watching that, that this was an incredibly useful, uplifting, hope-filled program. So blessings to you. Thank you. Blessings to everybody. All right. Wow. How about that, everybody? If that wasn't worth an hour of your time on a... Well, if you're not watching live any day of the week, huh? I look forward to sharing with you every Sunday at noon. And anytime you can come on YouTube or listen to the podcast, you are what makes this community so special. Go out and have a great day.